Hello. Hello. Um, if everybody could find a seat, uh, hopefully there are enough chairs here. Um, thank you all for coming. I'd like to welcome you to CSIS. Um, I'm Jeff Mankoff. I'm the Deputy Director of the Russia and Eurasia Program here. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, our talk today by, and I'm going to really try to pronounce the name correctly, um, Donika Obakoin. Okay, thank you. Um, who's going to be talking to us about uh, elections in the de facto states of Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Transnistria. Here in the U.S., we, when we do pay attention to this part of the world, I think we tend to look at the de facto states really in terms of their geopolitical significance, in terms of the relationship between uh, Russia and Georgia, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and then how all of this affects U.S. interests. Uh, I think there's been much less attention paid to what's actually going on inside these states and how the, the process of asserting their de facto uh, sovereignty has shaped political development in these states. And it's actually a very interesting topic because at a moment where uh, there's a lot of concern, certainly in Washington about um, the democratic backsliding, let's say, uh, in countries like Russia and Ukraine, one of the really underappreciated, undertold stories is the extent to which the de facto institutions in these de facto states are in some ways moving in the opposite direction. Um, and why that should be is kind of a, an interesting question, kind of a paradox. And so I hope um, Dr. Obakoin will uh, be able to explain some of, the, um, some of that mystery here to you all today. Um, we're going to have Dr. Abakwin give uh, his presentation for, what, about 30, 45 minutes or so? Um, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sergei Markadonov, who's a visiting fellow here with the Russia and Eurasia program to provide some commentary. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions for um, the rest of the session. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Donika Abakwin. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to present uh, my research, which has uh, been conducted over the last two years, really. And I should perhaps at the very beginning contextualize why this research was done. Um, it, it, my own background actually initially is in Irish politics, uh, deal with Northern Ireland, the Irish conflict. Um, and that's also the priority of the Irish government. Um, but so it might appear strange to you that uh, the Irish government more or less funded uh, this research project, and it was to coincide with the fact that they were chairing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, in 2012. And for the first six months of this year, uh, from January to July, our pres have the presidency of the European Union. So not, Ireland doesn't have any long-term strategic interests in these regions. We don't have any historical ties. Um, so there was a certain, you might say, vacuum in terms of information about the regions. And uh, I opportunistically offered my services through a competitive uh, competition, uh, essentially to write reports for the government uh, while they were uh, chairing the OSCE and, and uh, conducting the EU presidency on how the OSCE and EU could best ameliorate the, the uh, conflict situations in the regions. And then I had a follow-up um, grant, which was to look at the electoral processes in uh, Abkhazia, coinciding with their parliamentary elections in March of, of last year, and the uh, presidential elections in Transnistria, which occurred in, in December uh, 2011. So I spent a lot of time in the region. Uh, I, I visited uh, Abkhazia four times over 12 months. I was there for the August presidential elections, the March parliamentary elections. I was in Transnistria for their elections, and I was in Nagorno-Karabakh for the most recent elections in, in January, or sorry, of July of last year. Uh, and so those reports have been prepared. I'm kind of in the process of putting together articles based on that research, and that's more or less the background. Um, in terms of the, 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 the terminology that I use, I, I, I put forward always a standard disclaimer. It doesn't always please everybody, but I do it nonetheless. And that is that it, I am very extremely sensitive to the fact that this is a t the region and the, and, and, and the issues and the conflicts are very, um, they arouse passions in people, uh, depending on where they're coming from. And it's very difficult to, to ever find a series of words to describe things that will satisfy everyone. Actually, it's impossible. And it's something that I know well, being from Ireland. If you come to Ireland, what do you call it? Do you, do you call the area north of where I am, do you call it Northern Ireland? Do you call it the six counties? Do you call it Ulster? Where you're coming from politically will determine what you call things. Uh, but I think it's always, in my case, what I, I do is that I simply use the terms that are currently in use in the regions which I am analyzing. 
That's simply it. It doesn't in any way uh, give any indication of a political leaning or, or an acceptance of anything. It's, it's simply calling things as they are in the places that I'm actually visiting. And I do that, I try to do that wherever I go. Uh, as I said, it doesn't always please everybody, but that's my disclaimer, just in case anybody is going to be uh, upset about the terms that I use. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start by, by going through the elections one by one. It's a very ambitious uh, task, actually, to go through four elections. Many of you know, many of the details of which would be new to you. Um, some of you, of course, may be uh, uh, very big experts in the field, but I, I'm going to kind of give a very general overview and leave the questions and answers session to, to, to work out the details. Uh, first, um, the region itself. That's a map I've borrowed, which is one of the very few maps which uh, it kind of encompasses the entire area which I'm talking about. Uh, you see there, of course, uh, the de facto states themselves, Transnistria and the, and the Top corner there, um, you see, with, with the breaking away from Moldova, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, breaking away from Georgia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh there in the, in, the, in the corner, breaking away from Azerbaijan. Uh, these are the areas where the research took place. I should add, that, by the way, that I also went to Tbilisi, to Baku, to Yerevan, uh, to Kisinau to, to get the opinions of, 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 of uh, government officials there and, and, and people in, in, in non-governmental organizations as well. Uh, so it's not that I, I'm basing my findings or, or my research solely on the views of people in the de facto states uh, themselves. Uh, the elections, as I said, there were four elections I looked at. The first of these were the presidential elections in uh, Abkhazia. Um, Abkhazia already had attracted my interest uh, because of the fact that it already had something which is quite rare in the post-Soviet sphere, and that is a transfer of power uh, from government to opposition. And that occurred in 2004 uh, when uh, the candidate who won, Sergei Bagapsh, managed to defeat uh, the favorite of, of the Kremlin, essentially. The, the man who he defeated was a man, Raul Hajimba. He was a former KGB. Uh, he was well known to be, you know, getting support from, from Russia. And the electorate of Abkhazia more or less um, decided that Sergei Bagapsh was a more appropriate candidate for them. Uh, a pact was made whereby Raul Hajimba was offered the vice presidency. Uh, but that already had made it a very interesting uh, Entity, because Georgia, of course, the the, the political uh, state that it, it, it had seceded from, had never, up until that point, had a peaceful transfer of power uh, from government to opposition. You had the overthrow of Gamsa Kurdi, of course, in the um, the early 90s. You had the overthrow of Shevardnadze in 2003. So it was quite interesting that Abkhazia, despite its living in a rather challenging political neighbourhood and and having a lack of international recognition, managed to have that thing that we often associate with a more democratic system, an ability of an opposition to challenge an incumbent power and for that incumbent power to hand over power. Um, however, there are, there are aspects of the Abkhaz presidential elections, electoral system that you should be familiar with, which I guess put it in a less positive light, certainly if you're not Abkhaz, and that is that only um, uh, ethnic Abkhaz uh, candidates, or rather ethnic Abkhaz individuals can run as candidates for presidential elections. Uh, it's not, I, I lived in Central Asia for many years and I was familiar with the fact that there were language laws where you had to speak the titular language to run for election, for example in Kazakhstan or in Uzbekistan. They have that in Abkhazia also, you must speak Abkhaz to run for the presidency and a minority of people do speak Abkhaz fluently, but you also must be ethnic Abkhaz. And, uh, and again, that really excludes a large amount of, of the people who are living in Abkhazia. Uh, another interesting provision actually is that you cannot be above the age of 60 uh, to run for election in, in Abkhazia, which is kind of odd because Abkhazia has a long uh, tradition of being well known for its, its longevity. In, in Soviet times in particular, the people used to go there to study why people lived so long. So it seems to be a rather interesting uh, deviance from the norm that they have this age requirement as well. Um, so in terms of the election in 2011, uh, it was an unexpected election, it was a snap election because of the unexpected death of Sergei Begap. She died in an operating theatre in Moscow uh, when they were trying to, to alleviate some problems with his lungs. Uh, so his, his vice president, uh, Alexander Angfab, started with a certain, you might say, advantage um, and he he, he was very much, um, you might say, an anti-candidate. Uh, I, I, I've said this before, and I say it again, that if he was running in almost any larger political society in a state more familiar to you, he would never have a chance of winning. I mean, he made his whole campaign about essentially not campaigning, 
Um, he had no electoral slogans, no posters. Uh, he speaks in a very uncharismatic fashion, reels out statistics, doesn't allow anybody to, to speak, um, and, and, and essentially would have a, a long table of supporters uh, who would be there as wallpaper and would never say a word during his two-hour election meeting. He would invite questions, and if questions weren't forthcoming, he would simply speak anyway. Uh, you know, we, we were quite overwhelmed by this fact that he was the front runner, and yet he seemed so, so uh, unable, essentially, to do what we, we would call the rudimentary uh, election uh, techniques, but then, as, I, as I'll, I guess, argue that Abkhazia is a very small political society, so you don't actually have to go actively campaigning uh, for votes of people you don't really know, most of the people you would know personally anyway. So his running mate, Michael Logua, who never got to say very much, of course, during the campaign, he's vice presidential candidate. I should add, by the way, that the vice presidential nominees uh, for Abkhazia do not have to be ethnic Abkhaz. However, they always have been. Um, so they, they, there's a require. You could potentially, because there are so many minorities in Abkhazia, you could potentially, for example, have an Armenian vice presidential candidate. But that's never happened. Um, you move on then to Raul Hajimba, the man who was defeated in 2004. This was his third presidential election. Uh, he also ran in 2009. His running mate Svetlana Jorgenia might make him seem like a progressive. Abkhazia is a very patriarchal system. He has a, a female running mate, the first time ever in Abkhazia. However, when I tell you that she is the uh, wife of a former president who is now dead, the first president of Abkhazia, uh, that will put things in perspective, President Arzimba, who passed away some years ago. So she was primarily chosen for that reason, to provide a certain linkage to a, a previous uh, war hero in, in Abkhazia. And also she's supposed to be financially well-resourced, so she would be able to sustain herself during the campaign. Um, Raul Hajimba, interestingly enough, repackaged himself. In 2004, as I mentioned, he was primarily known as the Kremlin's candidate. Um, by, 2000, by, by 2011, he's primarily known as, as a man who has cornered the Abkhaz nationalist vote. He's, he's, you know, he, he more or less focuses on the issues that there's a creeping annexation coming from Russia, that they're worried about property being bought up by Russians, they're worried about the you know, encroachments uh, in terms of language. Uh, so he's, he's more or less no longer known as the pro-Russia candidate. He's actually the opposite. Uh, in many ways, his, his support base is very much based on a skepticism. Uh, well, what, how they put it is that they want to be treated as equals by Russia. That was more or less what I was getting from their campaign team. Uh, Sergei Shamba, uh, those of you that are Abkhazia watchers will be familiar with him, longtime foreign minister from Abkhazia. Um, he uh, had run a very professional campaign, extremely professional, uh, and I'll show you some pictures to illustrate that, but there were billboards, uh, very slick TV advertising, which I probably won't get time to show you, but essentially computer digital imagery of what an airport in Sukumi is going to look like when he's president, which looks bigger than Frankfurt Airport, to be honest, and has several terminals going to all parts of the world. This will all happen in his one term. He appropriated the term change. I mean, he was, he, he, it was like he'd looked at all the Western campaigns to see what, would, what had worked. He was the candidate of change, despite the fact that he was 14 years in government. Uh, he withdrew strategically before the election to present himself as an outsider and said, Angfab is the man of, of kind of, uh, and they also portrayed him, as, of course, as uncharismatic. He said, he's the man of the 19th century. He's an authoritarian figure who doesn't know how to communicate with people. Shamba's the man for the 21st century, and he's also going to be the guy to usher in a new generation of politicians in Abkhazia. How so? Because he was the oldest of the three candidates, despite looking remarkably fresh, actually, and, but he was in, in, already 60 and therefore could not run a second time. Uh, so he was going to be a one-term president if he was uh, successful. Successful. And he made a virtue of that saying, let me be a tool in your hands, essentially. I will be a one-term president bringing in a new generation of politicians. Forget the old kind of Soviet era figures like Ang Fab, uh, who's going to be around for two, two, two terms. Um, his running mate, Shamil uh, Adzinba, um, was quite, quite an interesting figure, but I won't, I won't discuss him now, to be honest, because we don't have uh, much time. Uh, there's just some photographs that I took with the candidates, just to illustrate the fact that I met them. It's a bit showing off on my part. Uh, with my wife in all occasions who traveled with me, uh, um, Angfab there, of course, unsmiling as, as, as normal. Uh, Raul Hajimba, after a very long meeting with uh, Abkhaz war veterans, which was the longest two hours of my life because it was completely in Abkhaz and I had no idea what was going on. Um, and, and Sergei Shamba, again, just so you can see from his demeanor, he's just kind of a natural, touchy-feely, friendly guy uh, who's, who's very much... Um, a persuader. Uh, certainly, if you didn't know any of the three candidates, and this is the point I would emphasize, you would vote really for Shamba, I think. I mean, he was a very charismatic and, and, and very personable individual, and very tele televisual as well, quite a handsome uh, in individual uh, in, in the flesh. Um, so I, I've more or less made some of these points already. The campaign uh, uh, slogans, essentially, Angfab saying, I'm not making any promises. That's for politicians. I'm not really a politician. 
uh, Hajimba appealing to the Abkhaz nationalist vote, which was always going to put a ceiling on how much he was going to get. Uh, and Shamba, lots of slogans, lots of promises, thousands of jobs being promised, uh, reaching out to, to all the ethnicities, reaching out to the youth. Um, there are three major parties in Abkhazia. United Abkhazia was more or less the party of Bagapsh, the, the, the dead president, so they were backing Angfab. Uh, the form of national unity of Abkhazia, that's Raul Hajimba's party. And the party of economic development of Abkhazia is the party of Bezlan Bupa, who's the richest man in Abkhazia. He's kind of the Ivanashvili of Abkhazia. Uh, and uh, he was backing Shamba. He's not personally popular. He did run for the presidency in 2009, didn't do well, and therefore figured it was better to back somebody who was more popular and charismatic than he. So he was kind of a, a figure in the shadows behind Shamba. Um, in terms of um, the, the, the campaign itself, I, I, I'll just simply say that the Kitovani interview, which I've mentioned here, um, was a turning point in the election campaign. It, it was quite clear that Shamba's people, they were doing their own private surveys of opinion, were, were beginning to feel a week before the election that they weren't going to win. So they, they trundled out, uh, you might say, some black propaganda, which was that they got uh, Kitovani, uh, who was a Georgian military figure from the early 1990s, who is hated in Abkhazia because he's believed that he somehow started the war in in August 1992, um, he more or less said in a, tele a televised interview that he had cooperated with Angfab uh, during the, um, the 1990s. So essentially, Angfab was being accused of treason. Now, Shamba, of course, denied that he was responsible for this, but it was quite clear he was going to benefit from it. So his people were more or less behind it, but Shamba himself denies any knowledge of this happening. Uh, but it, it actually worked against him. It was counterproductive. It, it, it went against a very strong tradition in Abkhazia of you know, essentially, it's such a small society, you have to live with your neighbor after the election. So name calling, calling people very, you know, leveling very serious charges against people is not done. It's also a reason that they don't have television debates. Uh, this thing of publicly haranguing people on TV is seen as very unnecessarily adversary, but also, again, in a politically small society, it's quite difficult to pull off. Um, though, as we'll see, they did have one in Transnistria, and that was the first in, in, in among the de facto states. Uh, here are just some pictures I took from the campaign itself. Campaign is mainly based around public meetings. Uh, you know, you, you, because it's a politically small society, you do have a good chance of beating a huge chunk of the electorate during the, uh, the couple of weeks of the campaign. So here are some just photos from the campaign meetings, and Fab addressing, often outdoors, because it was in August, of course, so weather was wonderful. Um, Raul Hajimba meeting the veterans, campaign literature, very biographical, as you can see as well. Uh, and here's Shamba, there's a video TV in the center of Sukumi, uh, the billboards, uh, you know, very, very lavish production. Uh, handouts, uh, handbills, you know, on, on, on television or tele telephone poles as well, and the public meetings. Often they were very big, as you can see. And again, he had a different strategy from Angfab. His strategy was very, um, you'd have seven or eight people who would, and, he, and they were very carefully chosen. You'd have a woman, you'd have a young person, you'd have an old person, you'd have an Armenian, a war veteran, and each would speak wonderfully about Shamba. So you were almost you know, full of excitement before he came on the stage. It was very much like a, a classic political meeting that you would expect uh, in, in a larger political in, environment. Uh, the results, though, show that his technique didn't work in Abkhazia. Shamba did uh, rather badly. He, he more or less co-polled with uh, Raul Hajimba at about 20%, Alexander Angfab winning uh, in the first round. And, uh, and because of the Kitovani interview mainly, uh, he didn't retain the services of Shamba, who was prime minister, of course, before the election, nor any of his uh, team. Uh, he dismissed them unceremoniously. Many of them didn't even get official letters, I was told, afterwards. They just simply found their, the, the, someone was coming into the room taking away the boxes. Um, so he didn't kind of see himself, Angfab didn't see himself as a, a chairman or a president of all the talents. He was very much, I won, everybody else is out. If we look at the parliamentary elections in Abkhazia, which took place in March, I'm going to go very quickly through, because I have lots of graphs which we really won't have time to delve into, so I'll just simply give you the headlines, which is that um, it's a second ballot system, as is the presidential system. Uh, it's not very party orientated because the electoral law doesn't allow parties to run in the majority of the seats. The maximum number of uh, candidates which a party can put forward is, is 11 and there's 35 seats in the legislature. So you will never have a one-party legislature for that reason. It's militated against it in the electoral law. Um, so the larger parties, the United Abkhazia and Hajimba's National Unity of Abkhazia parties put forward 11 candidates in the elections, smaller amounts for the Communist Party and the Party of Economic Development, um, and a much lower turnout 
44% compared to over 70% in the presidential elections, which is typical of normal elections because Parliament doesn't have the power, in, and, and that's the situation in most post-Soviet states. It's a presidential system, so people are less inclined to turn out uh, to vote. That said, it's extremely competitive, and that's one thing that struck me. If you compare 2007, 2012, the number of candidates, I'll move to 2012 here, you see that um, uh, almost a third had five to ten candidates running in the constituency. Um, in Sukumi in particular, nobody got elected in the, on the first round. There were so many candidates running for election, and so fragmented was the vote. Um, so hotly contested, but in terms of gender, as you can see, it's not a particularly women-friendly political environment. Only one woman elected out of 35. Uh, that's a steep decline, actually, from the previous parliament, which was a high of four. Three, three in the election and one in the by-election. Um, I'm going to move on to the ethnicity of candidates, so it's, it's worth showing you what the current breakdown of population is in Abkhazia. These figures, of course, are, you might say, open to question, um, because they were conducted, we'll say, in an environment which is not particularly uh, conducive to conducting very good sensei. But the, um, the Abkhaz are now deemed to be a slight majority of the population of Abkhazia, 50.71%. However, if you look at that, they've jumped remarkably since the previous census in 2003. And I, I think what's happening there is a lot, of, a lot of people of mixed marriages are professing themselves to be Abkhaz on the census simply because it will give them preferential treatment, politically, economically, and other ways like that, which I've seen in other countries as well. So, um, but officially, they're just about half of the population. Uh, significant minorities of Georgians, uh, of course, far down from their 1989 high, the last uh, Soviet census and uh, a significant minority of Armenians and still some Russians living there as well. Uh, but in, if, you, if you look at the candidates, here's 2007, 2012, you have 81% um, of the candidates are ethnic Abkhaz, 84% in the recent election are ethnic Abkhaz. So this is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a system dominated by the ethnic Abkhaz. Despite their numerical, uh, relative numericals in, in inferiority, they do very, very well. And that's not a coincidence. Um, you have a lot of, you have a, a number of safe seats for ethnic minorities. So for example, there are three seats which are always held by Armenians and the Abkhaz never contest them. Uh, they broke that gentleman's agreement though with the Russians in this election. Notice that um, if you look at the number of um, successful uh, MPs, there were three successful MPs who were Russian, ethnic Russian in 2007, that's down to zero now. And that's because essentially those gentleman agreements whereby the Abkhaz did not run in constituencies where the Russians were uh, strong, numerically strong, uh, they broke that agreement or they, they more or less called it off and therefore there's now no ethnic Russian in the, uh, the Abkhaz legislature. You might ask, by the way, what language do they speak? Many people do anyway. What language do they speak in the Abkhaz legislature? It's Abkhaz, surprisingly. Many people think it's Russian. They do have a little box in the corner whereby somebody translates from Abkhazia into Russian for that small number who can't speak. Uh, who can't speak Abkhaz, but that, that's part of the policy. I mean, they want to make the Abkhaz language stronger in Abkhazia, and of course, the more ethnic Abkhaz candidates you have, I guess, the more that's facilitated, so it's a deliberate policy, which again, I've seen in other countries. It's not unusual to Abkhazia. I've seen it in Kazakhstan, for example, a country I lived in for a couple of years. Very high turnover of candidates. That's another big feature. In the 2012 election, for example, only five of the 35 incumbents successfully held their seats. The majority either didn't run or they were unsuccessful. And most of those who were successful had to w fight a, a second round. So very competitive elections. Uh, that was the, 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 a very striking feature of what I saw. If I move on to Transnistria, uh, and again, I'm rushing through these, I know, but it, it, it's very ambitious to do four case studies in one presentation. Uh, here you see the very grandiose buildings of, of, on top, you see the presidential palace from Soviet era, of course. Uh, it was built and uh, Lenin's still outside. Um, and uh, the Supreme Soviet, the parliament uh, of Transnistria. Um, if you ever wondered what an Abkhaz and South Ossetian embassy looks like in another unrecognized state, this is what it looks like. This is the Abkhaz and South Ossetian embassies in uh, Tiraspol in Transnistria. Uh, I'm not sure what they do. I'd love to meet them actually and find out what they do, but I didn't get an opportunity on the, in, on, during the occasions I was in Transnistria. Um, the presidential election in, in, in Transnistria was fundamentally different from its counterparts in Karabakh and Abkhazia because there were, there were no observable term limits before in Transnistria. Abkhazia had observed a two-term limit, uh, Karabakh has, uh, has observed a two-term limit, whereas you had a man in Transnistria who was running for his fifth term of office. 
Uh, and he was very much considered, or at least he considered himself, the founding father of Transnistria, despite the fact that he wasn't born in Transnistria and had only moved to Transnistria relatively late in life. Uh, he was uh, Igor Smirnov, he is Igor Smirnov. Um, he presented himself more or less as the state builder, a man who would usher uh, in, uh, in renewed prosperity, I guess, into, into Transnistria. He was challenged on this occasion by a very strong contender, Anatoly Kaminsky, uh, strong not because of his personality, but because of his support. He was more or less backed by Russia during this campaign. When I say Russia, I mean the Kremlin. Uh, he was, for various reasons, um, Igor Smirnov was no longer popular in the, in the Kremlin, and they had spent quite a bit of time trying to persuade him to retire before the election. And when he decided to put forward his candidature, a very hostile media campaign was 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 um, focused on him. Uh, for example, he was accused on on Russian television of of misappropriating funds, uh, and his son, in particular, Oleg Smirnov, was accused of misappropriating four million euro, or sorry, four million dollars in in humanitarian aid from Russia to Transnistria. And it was a very clever ploy. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not. Could be, could be not. But it was a very clever smear because essentially this was money destined for old people, for pensioners. And pensioners are an extremely important constituency in Transnistria. I mean, 200,000 people have left Transnistria in the last 20 years. Uh, so what you're left is with quite an old population. Um, so what, what was being suggested on Russian television, which is what the television that everybody watches in Transnistria, was that the incumbent was more or less siphoning off money destined for pensioners for his own private gain. That's a pretty serious charge. Um, and it was on, it, it was constantly, re, uh, his, his, uh, an, um, uh, an extradition warrant was put out for the arrest of Oleg Smirnov during the election campaign. So all, all gloves were off. I mean, they really went out for Smirnov in this campaign, and they gave their backing to Anatoly Kaminsky, the second candidate here. Yevgeny Chevchuk was the third candidate. Uh, former Speaker of Parliament, former leader of the uh, Renewal Party, but had strategically, uh, or maybe opportunistically, left in 2009, largely because he was um, unhappy with the trends uh, with Smirnov's uh, rule. So being two or three years out of power meant that he was able to present himself as an outsider. Uh, as an agent of change. Again, he, he appropriated the slogan change in this election. He argued that Kaminsky was just as old as Smirnov and very like him in terms of his political style. Um, so people who went for Chevchuk, and he was the ultimate victor as we'll see, went for him not thinking that they were taking a gamble. He had the political experience, but he also had the youth. And he had a reputation for being a reformer, which neither of the two you know, larger individuals, Smirnov and Kaminsky had. Ola, they knew he had three minor candidates. Ola Kerjan, the communist, uh, party uh, representative, Andrei Safonov, who was a veteran of election campaigns, he ran three times uh, altogether, and Dmitry uh, Soin, who was previously a supporter of Kaminsky, but decided to go, uh, go it alone in this election at the last minute. The major issues, by the way, were the, um, the role of Russia in the Transnistrian economy, which is hugely important. Um, Transnistria could not survive without Russian support. That's the bottom line. Um, and when the Kremlin made it clear they didn't want Smirnov, Smirnov's reaction was to adopt an election campaign slogan, the Republic is not for sale. In other words, we can't be bought. Um, but that suggested that his own fate and Transnistria's fate were inextricably linked. And the electorate managed to figure out that that's not true. We can dump you and keep the Russian support. Uh, and actually, if we keep you, maybe we'll jeopardize the Russian support. So that actually didn't work in the end. Um, the uh, election campaign itself was full of black PR. I have some wonderful examples here, which I, again, I probably will, I, I don't think I'll have time to show you, but there was a wonderful black PR campaign against uh, Chevchuk, for example, where they had very unsavory individuals um, presenting themselves as Chevchuk supporters. So for example, you had these homeless people without teeth who were obviously drinking alcohol and drunk, and they were saying, yeah, we're very well-educated people and we vote for Chevchuk. Uh, we're Chevchuk people. And they were putting it forward as official advertising for Chevchuk, even though it was obvious, I guess, to an outside observer that these were not. And they, another one I remember was a, a blonde woman uh, who was, again, she had a, a, a bottle of whiskey in front of her. She was smoking a cigarette. She's saying, I don't know much about politics. You know, I don't know much about uh, what Chevchuk stands for. But he's a cute guy, and that's what matters. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm for Chevchuk. Um, you know, so this was the kind of black PR. It was, it was a very, compared to Abkhazia, compared to Karabakh, which, as I said, they, 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 they don't get into dirty campaigns. Uh, Transnistria was very dirty. Uh, you might say it was partially due to the fact that Transnistria is a bit larger. It's, it's about you know, 550,000 people, so it's not that small a political uh, society. Um, there was a TV debate. That was for the first time ever, not only in Transnistria, but in any of the de facto states. Um, the first debate took place among only four candidates. The uh, Smirnov, of course, didn't participate. He thought he was too big for that. Uh, neither did Kaminsky, because he had Russian support. That, in retrospect, was a mistake. The Chevchuk and the three minor candidates debated among themselves. Um, and then there was a second TV 
TV debate two days before the second round between Chevchuk and Kaminsky, and Chevchuk won that debate hands down. And that was one of the reasons why, as we'll see, uh, he did remarkably well in the second round. Here are just some of the posters here. Republic not for sale, that's Igor Smirnov, looking very pensive. Then you have the uh, imprimatur of Putin for the Kaminsky campaign. Chevchuk, he found it very hard to get billboard space because, of course, it's all in private hands and many of them were associated with the president. But this is his poster for order. Um, this is the Communist Party candidate, Oleg Herjan. I, I, I have the pictures there of the merchandise because it was the most commercial Communist Party I've ever seen. You could buy anything in this, in this, uh, in this Communist Party headquarters. Um, Dimitri Soin, every, every little state, every little poli political society has their really exotic characters and Dimitri Soin is the one for Transnistria. Um, he is wanted by Interpol uh, for murder on the, on the request of Moldova, that's a serious thing I guess, but uh, he, he also has a yoga class, here you see him naked here in the corner, uh, he runs yoga classes he has a lot of female groupies, um, and he runs also a Che Guevara School of Political Leadership, um, of which I'm, I am the graduate number 56, as you see here, uh, which means there haven't been that many graduates, but I, was, I became an honorary graduate uh, on, on visiting him. Um, he, he, he was, I think, the most interesting political... And, and actually, I, I make him sound like an oddball, but if, in, in a different environment, had Shevchuk not been running and had Soin declared himself earlier, he might have been a more serious campaigner, but he, he, he entered the campaign extremely late, and, uh, and as I said, there were already big shots in the campaign, so he did, he did quite poorly, as we'll see in the end. And here's uh, Safanov, the, the last candidate, who, as I said, ran in two previous campaigns. Uh, he's head of the Political Science Association of Transnistria, so any of you who are political scientists, you go to Transnistria, this is your man. Um, but here's the result. Um, Chevchuk uh, emerged first in the first round. Uh, Anatoly Kaminsky's, Russia's man, only came second. Uh, Igor Smirnov, this was the shock, didn't even get in the top two. He wasn't going forward to the second round. And then minor votes for the minor candidates who were squeezed out by the larger uh, rivalry uh, that was at play in this election. So Smirnov objected. He put in complaints to the Central Election Commission saying there was fraud and whatnot. The Central Election Commission um, reviewed the complaints. They, they identified minor uh, inconsistencies in, in, and, and minor um, violations, but nothing that would have um, overcome the deficit in Smirnov's vote. So Smirnov was eliminated. And that's, I should emphasize, that's a big first for um, de facto state. I mean, that the incumbent not only loses, but doesn't even make it to the second round. Um, and that Russia's candidate, again, is trailing. And as we'll see, when we look at the second round, Kaminsky actually gets less votes in the second round than he did in the first round. Let's look at that again. In the first round, he got 25%. In the second round, he got 19%, even though the smaller candidates had been eliminated. That shows you two things, I guess, that once everybody saw that the, the momentum was with Chevchuk, they all started moving towards Chevchuk. Uh, and secondly, how badly Kaminsky did in that TV debate two days before the election. He was annihilated. Uh, Chevchuk was, was really on top of that uh, debate. And it shows you something that a lot of people said to me in Transnistria, particularly those who were involved in surveying opinion, that Russia backed um, Kaminsky simply because of the positions he held. They said, okay, we don't want Smirnov. Who do you want to dislodge him? The obvious person is the number two. Who's the number two in Transnistria? Well, it's probably the guy who's head of parliament and, and head of the largest party, so we'll back him. But it wasn't based on any strong relationship with, with Kaminsky, and he proved to be a very, very poor candidate in reality. And finally, we move on to Nagorno-Karabakh, photographs which I could spend forever explaining the significance of, but I'll move, move swiftly on. Um, Previous elections, um, 1996, 1997, uh, the reason why they were in rapid succession was, of course, Robert Kucharian, who went on to be president of Armenia, was president of Nagorno-Karabakh before that, making him a rather interesting political phenomenon of being president, at least in inverted commas, of, of two different states. Um, in this election in 2012, you had the incumbent, Bako Sakian. He'd been elected in 2007, a rather modest, unassuming individual, certainly not that charismatic, um, running for re-election. What was interesting about this election in 2012 is that you had a very strong challenger, Vitaly Balasanyan. He was strong because he was a war veteran. He's in every school in Karabakh, you see his picture. He's a pot you know, he's, he, according to the people who live in Karabakh today, he is a war hero and therefore is somebody who could not be dismissed lightly. He was a former deputy defense minister in Karabakh, a, uh, also a former presidential advisor. So he had experience. He was already in the National Assembly in Karabakh and he had war experience, which is vital, of course, to, to be taken seriously politically in Karabakh. And 
unlike his predecessor who ran in 2007, Massi Smalian, whose experience was primarily in the, in the NGO world and, and, and as a deputy foreign minister, he was, he was considered a, a, a more heavyweight individual. But Massi Smalian, the opposition candidate from 2007, lent his support of Vitaly Balasanian, which made them quite a lethal team. Um, and then you had two, two pseudo candidates, a very common phenomenon in the post Soviet sphere of putting up, you know, the government putting up uh, fake candidates to give the impression of competition. So before Vitaly Balasanian had put forward his candidature, uh, the government had more or less set it up so that um, Sahakian would be up against uh, these two people, Saha Manyan, who's a deputy, uh, deputy rector of a university, local university in Stepanakert, and this Valery uh, Kachatar, if I can pronounce his name, Kachatarian, uh, who uh, was an unemployed pensioner. Now you can imagine, what is an unemployed pensioner doing running for president unless he's a pseudo candidate? Uh, and I, I interviewed them all, and I interviewed Valeri. Valeri was perhaps the, the most interesting, because I said, what made you run for president? You know, you're, you're, you, I didn't say you don't have much experience, but I was you know, curious to know why a man of such limited experience would put himself forward. And he said more or less, uh, well, you know, I, I, I knew, I thought I had the trust of the people, I felt I had a good chance, so I, I decided to put myself forward. And then I asked him the next question, so why did you withdraw? at the end, because he withdrew 10 days before the election. He said, well, after campaigning for some time, he had one public meeting. Um, after campaigning for some time, uh, I figured that the president had more support than me, more resources, and therefore I threw in my support with him. Not the most persuasive analysis of why your narrative of why you run for presidency. So what essentially happened was that Balasanyan's candidature put the cat among the pigeons and the pseudo candidates well one stayed on Arkady um, who ran a reasonably professional campaign but it, his campaign was so lacking in momentum his office was always empty his phone never rang I said do you do public meetings yes you know but most people know me anyway there's no need to go out there kind of actively soliciting votes and as you'll see the result perhaps indicates um, uh, what the result of that lack of uh, initiative uh, was. Uh, we met the different candidates. This is just me showing off again. Here we are with uh, the, all the candidates uh, one by one. And then there's, uh, and this is Valeri who withdrew. Um, and then we have election day. You have the electoral list outside, of course, the, each polling station. Uh, 149, I think, polling stations. And again, it's a small political society, so the, the, the electoral register in some of the polling stations was like 50, 60 people. Very, very small. Um, three people on the ballot paper. Um, again, that's a rural polling station. That's an urban one. You can see the difference in the architecture and the internal uh, furniture and whatnot. And uh, we, of course, you can only be at one count, so we went to this one here. We, we just la it was getting dark, and you had to be in a polling station by 8 o'clock, so we, we picked one randomly and ended up in this one, where these were the votes for Balasanyan, these were for Sahakian, this was for Arkady, the third candidate, and these were the spoiled ballots. The results came in very quickly, by the way. You might wonder, like, how are these votes tabulated and how can we be sure if they're accurate or whatnot? I mean, my, my, my answer to that is that what's really important is that you have, firstly, genuine opposition candidates, and then you have those opposition candidates, team workers, in each polling station. And then they, they will observe whether there are any violations. So what we did is we rushed back from the polling station uh, into Stepanakert, and at that stage, we went to the opposition headquarters, and they were, you know, it was a frenzy of activity. People were getting mobile phone conversations from each polling station saying, what's the result there? They were doing tabulations. And already two hours after the polls had closed, it was already becoming clear that it was about a two-to-one majority in favor of the incumbent, with almost no votes for Arkady, and that's the way it turned out. 65% um, for uh, the incumbent, but an unprecedented 32% for uh, Vitaly Balasanyan. So that's the highest ever vote for an opposition candidate uh, in, in, uh, in Karabakh. Uh, Arkady, as you see, getting less than 1% of the vote. Uh, the turnout is quite high. Overall assessment of the campaign, the vote itself was an accurate res reflection of, of, of the votes cast. I mean, the, 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 I didn't get any sense that there was a vote rigging in that sense. Uh, however, it wasn't a fair campaign. Um, the incumbent had about 40 campaign offices. The two opposition figures, or the, the, you know, the one real and one uh, pseudo, had one campaign office. Uh, the incumbent had about 1,000 party workers working for him. And I asked them, I said, how can you do all of this within a, with a spending limit of 15,000 euros, 6 million dram? And they said, well, I mean, how are you, how are you having 1,000 campaign workers? He said, oh, they're volunteers, so we don't pay them. 
I said, well, how do you have 40 offices? And they said, well, uh, they're donated by supporters. So, of course, it's in-kind donation. It's not declared. So you can see how, you know, the incumbent has a huge administrative resource in his favor, which, again, is something that's quite common in the former Soviet Union. But the significance, perhaps, from, a, from outside Karabakh perspective is that uh, Karabakh had, for many years, had a partly free status under the Freedom House rankings, which are quite influential. Uh, and they had boasted about this in many uh, fora. So it was very disappointing for them that in 2010 they lost this and went from partly free to not free because of the fact that their parliamentary elections uh, didn't produce any opposition candidates. Only pro-presidential ones were elected. But with this election, uh, because of the very strong opposition campaign of Vitaly Balasanyan, they regained that partly free status, which is, of course, very um, important for the political elite there, I think, in many respects. Um, so overall conclusions. Um, about these de facto states. And I said I've rushed through four very complicated case studies, so forgive me for that, but that's, that's the problem with having an overambitious presentation project. Um, the election's um, very competitive, um, surprisingly competitive. Um, the results are unpredictable, and that's something that shouldn't be taken for granted in, in post-Soviet elections. As I said, I lived for a year in Uzbekistan. I lived for a couple of years in Kazakhstan. I know what uncompetitive elections are like, and I know what predictable results are like when the president, it's just a matter of whether the president will get 90% or 92%. Um, these were unpredictable elections, um, particularly in, in, in Abkhazia and in Transnistria. Nobody expected the outcome, for example, in Transnistria. What's also very significant is that my experience, certainly, of looking at these elections counters what is a very popular narrative in, 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 with some people, certainly the political elite in, in, in Baku, in Tbilisi, in Kisinau, that everything that happens in these uh, political environments is controlled by an external force. So that, you know, what happens in Karabakh is completely controlled by uh, Yerevan. What happens in, in, in Kisinau, or sorry, in Transnistria is completely controlled by Moscow and the same in Abkhazia. That was not my experience. And I, in actual fact, um, what's interesting is some, often the results are counter to what the Kremlin has explicitly said is its preference. Now, you can go down a narrative which is also popular among the conspiratorial minded that this is all theatrics, that they've actually got a script to pretend they're being competitive. But to be honest, if you were there, I think you know the difference between the. I, I said I lived in Central Asia for five years. I know theatrics. This wasn't theatrical. That's my opinion on it anyway. Um, so, what do these elections achieve? They achieve more or less what the you know, elections achieve anywhere else. They are a mechanism whereby people choose who will govern them. Because even though these societies are not recognized, they still have to more or less get the rubbish collected, you know, send their kids to school. You know, they have to find some way of organizing themselves in the absence of recognition. So elections do that. In that sense, they are very normal. And the election issues that people raise were extremely boring. I mean, like, you know, they, they, people sometimes think that people are always talking about what are you going to do to solve the conflict? What do you think about Georgia? What do you think about Russia or Azerbaijan? Nobody mentioned these things during the election campaigns. They were talking about health, education, roads, extremely ordinary and all the more extraordinary for the fact that they were ordinary, because they take place in a rather unusual political environment. And my last assessment, I guess, is that it's, it's remarkable that when, you know, there are quite a lot of people that are, do look at this part of the world, but none of them seem to focus on elections. Certainly, I, 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 I couldn't, when I went out with this mission of, you know, evaluating these elections, I would say, well, who else has written about this? And let me, you know, therefore compare my results with theirs. I couldn't find anybody. Um, I mean, and again, if there are people out there, please let me know, because I would love to engage with them. But most people, when they look at the region, they look at conflict, they look at geopolitics, and this is what Jeffrey was saying in his, in his opening, that they, 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 they assume that these regions are the pawns of great powers. Now, that's not to say that great powers are not important. But I think if you adopt that narrative wholesale, you exclude any domestic agency in the regions themselves. And I think that's the key point that I would make in this presentation. And I welcome Sergei's uh, response <laughs> and, the, and your questions, of course. OK, that, that was great. I, I have plenty of questions myself. But before we get into that, I think maybe we'll just turn it over to uh, Sergei. Thank you, Jeff. First of all, let me express my admiration and gratitude to my uh, good friend and colleague Donaka because uh, he uh, represented very colorful picture of the situation in different de facto states. It was not uh, so geo strategy with some schemes, but it was a real analysis on the situation on the ground. And you have felt the difference between some abstract geo strategy or geopolitical schemes and field research fulfilled by empirical data, which is uh, so crucially important. Uh, let me make some turn from uh, empirical data and facts to uh, theoretical observation, methodological observations on uh, the de facto states. I think uh, this uh, problem is crucially important for all analysts uh, who uh, work uh, over 
the issues of the post-Soviet transformations, the way from the post-Soviet space to diversified Eurasia. Because uh, the existence of de facto states itself uh, reflects, first of all, the huge gap between formal judicial issues and practices. From the formal judicial point of view, there is no subject to, to be discussed. Because Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, or Transnistria are not recognized by most of UN uh, members, like in the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and by none of UN members, like Nagorno-Karabakh or Transnistria. And this is why they are not existing from the formal judicial point of view. But in practice, in reality, they have existed. Not for one year, two years. People uh, visit uh, schools, finish school, mm, been married and uh, doing business, uh, travels, and, uh, and so on. V vote, by the way, from time to time, and change the power. There is a dynamics. Uh, but uh, the second uh, crucially important uh, point the existence of de facto states uh, reflects uh, the incomplete formation of the post-Soviet statehood. Uh, I uh, repeated this thesis uh, plenty of times, but as they put it in the uh, ancient Rome, repetitio est matro studiorum. I think uh, there is a difference between uh, the end of the USSR as a formal judicial fact and the end of the USSR as a historical process. I think existence of the de facto states uh, has proven that USSR and or as the historical process is not over till nowadays. Because we have non-recognized entities, non-recognized bodies, absence of diplomatic relations between former USSR republics. And before the resolution of all above mentioned problems, we could not speak about the finish of this process as historical one not only judicial. I think uh, I absolutely agree with uh, Jeff and Donaka that uh, for, for a long period, analysis of de facto states uh, were restricted uh, by uh, some obstacles. This topic was a hostage of uh, some uh, approaches. The first one is geopolitical. When situation in Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh, South Ossetia, was perceived uh, through the prism of geopolitical rivalry between greater powers like United States, Russia, or uh, internationally recognized uh, states like Georgia, Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, Ukraine, Russia, and, and so on. The next context is conflict. Those entities were perceived or considered only through the prism of the conflicts. This is why most of them uh, were considered like temporarily. This is why we have a specific term in the Western media and analytical society like breakaway republics. They broke, but maybe in midterm uh, or short term perspective, parts of the parental states. And uh, the third context uh, could be characterized like analysis of different deviations. Hand of the Kremlin, Armenian lobbies, and then some other boogeymen. Uh, I think uh, most of analysts uh, have ignored uh, evident uh, facts. Uh, the first uh, one is dynamics in those entities, like transfers of power, like existence of opposition, uh, freedom of uh, express of views, uh, political competition, and, and so on. Uh, many people uh, analyzing uh, de facto states uh, showed or represented uh, the picture there like Abkhaz people or South Ossetians are uh, organized army, which follow their order decreed by President or Moscow, Kremlin, and, and, and so on, so on. But there were in many cases, and Donaka described it brilliantly, when position of Kremlin opposed the position of people on the ground. The case of Bagapsh in 2004. Don't forget about cases in South Ossetia. A recent case with Ala Gioeva or case of 2001. Don't forget that in 2001, Kakoiti was elected not as a, a Kremlin's uh, protege, Kremlin's appointee. 
that time, Kremlin supported Ludwig Chibirov, and by the way, Dmitry Sanakoyev, who is now a pro-Georgian uh, politician of uh, the Ossetian background. Uh, the same situation is with uh, Transnistria, or uh, we could remember the experience of Nagorno-Karabakh. In Armenia, Dashnak Tsutyun, the oldest uh, party of Armenian origin, was prohibited in the period of Livon Petrosian presidentship. But at the same time, in parallel, in Nagorno-Karabakh, this party played a significant domestic role. It was one of the leading forces in these de facto states. And uh, don't forget about some contradictions between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh on uh, so-called occupied territories and uh, so on, so on, so on. This is why uh, at least we need to recognize, in the context of unrecognized or not completely recognized entities, that uh, the dynamics, especially domestic dynamics in uh, those entities, are a little bit more complicated. It has uh, more complexities than some propagandist uh, or politicized stereotypes. I think uh, the electoral campaigns in the de facto uh, states, despite of general uh, logics and goals, have uh, their own uh, agenda, very important. Uh, frequently it's uh, ignored but it's necessary to pay special attention to those goals. The first uh, goal is uh, to show, to send the message to the international community uh, that uh, those entities are existing regardless of uh, absence of recognition. We are Transnistrians, we are people from Nagorno-Karabakh, we are Abkhaz people, we are existing. And those electoral campaigns have to prove this fact. You could recognize it, to support it, to, to hate us, but we are existing. It's, it's kind of message. The second point is uh, to win a competition with parental states. And uh, one of the most popular slogans among Abkhaz people and Assets, let's see on Georgia. After the USSR dissolution in uh, 1991, there were no cases of civilized transfer of power from one president to another one. What's about Gamsa Khurdia, who was overthrown in uh, 1992? What's about Shevardnadze, who left this post due to the revolution of the roses, but not due to elections, due to elections, but parliamentary elections, which were falsified and, and so on. And uh, the case of... Uh, Cohabitation in Georgia is not completely resolved till the, till the, 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 this October. Uh, the same approach is discussed widely in Nagorno-Karabakh. In Nagorno-Karabakh, there were no such traditions like uh, inheriting power from uh, the father to son. This is why it's also used for discussion for appealing to have uh, self-determination, uh, self-sufficient state, separate from the parental uh, state. Uh, in uh, the case of Transnistria, a parliamentary crisis in Moldova was also perceived by leaders of Transnistria as a negative pattern, which uh, would not be helpful for uh, the developments in Transnistria. And the third, uh, last no least, uh, uh, point, uh, on, uh, of, of motivation to provide electoral campaign. It's a special request for democratic procedures for uh, small uh, communities. Donaka told uh, about it, about the uh, square of those entities and size of population, but it's necessary to uh, clarify this issue uh, in a more detailed way. Uh, what, what, what does it mean? Uh, people in Nagorno-Karabakh, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, won uh, military clashes. They uh, survived uh, huge uh, physical losses of population. You know that uh, before the Georgian-Abkhazian uh, military confrontation of 1992-1993, the uh, population of Abkhaz, Abkhaz population, composed uh, 93,000 people. And due to uh, the military clash, about 3,000 people from this uh, amount were killed. 
and many people were injured after this clash. Practically every family has its own memory on this conflict. This is why people uh, make conclusion. We deserve the right to be free, not only from Georgia, from Russia, from, from other uh, centers of the power, but inside our community. We uh, liberated ourselves not uh, in favor of dictatorship. Uh, this uh, problem was uh, highly uh, discussed, especially in the electoral campaign in South Ossetia in 2011-2012. Of course, we won uh, due to Russia, of course, uh, five days war. But for what? For Kakoite? For his clan? For his family? No. It's a very important motivation. Uh, speaking about uh, Donaga's uh, presentation itself, honestly speaking, I have felt uh, the lack of information and analysis on South Ossetia. Of course, uh, this uh, entity is uh, rather different from Abkhazia, especially in the West, to those uh, de facto states are uh, analyzed and mentioned. Uh, uh, through the uh, dot Abkhazia dot uh, point, through the point, Abkhazia point, South Ossetia. But they are very different. And of course, Abkhazia has much more resources for the independent statehood than uh, South Ossetia, which practically has no any resources. But anyway, the problem is not only resources or aspirations of the people. Dynamics is also very interesting. Maybe uh, South Ossetia would be in mid-term or long-term prospect uh, part of Russian Federation. I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure that Russia really is really eager to have South Ossetia as a part of uh, the country. But there is a request for uh, qualitative governance and uh, choice which could not be justified only by the uh, situation of, of the war. Of course, uh, South Ossetia, uh, in comparison with Abkhazia, looks like less democratic. But this situation uh, was not eternal, was not constant. It changed. In the period of early 90s, uh, don't forget that uh, South Ossetia also survived some successful transfers of power from Ludwig Chibirov to Eduard Kakoite, and decline of democratic procedures and shift to uh, dictatorship uh, was provoked by uh, all circumstances of unfreezing of the conflict in 2004, when and where uh, resources for choice on the ground was rather minimal, and unfreezing on the, on, on the conflict from the Georgian side also provoked reaction in South Ossetia, reaction and uh, request for mobilization and restrictions from the uh, point of democratic development. This is why I could uh, mention only uh, one minus of the presentation, uh, information on uh, South Ossetia, because it would be also useful. But I think the greatest plus of the presentation was uh, consideration of the de facto states uh, like diversified phenomenon. Donica tried to uh, pay our attention that Transnistria is not the same as Abkhazia, and uh, both of those uh, entities are not the same as Nagorno Karabakh. Very different ethnic composition, development, party system, uh, relations with uh, Russia, by the way. Because, you know, if Russia supported electoral campaigns in uh, Transnistria, and especially Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, this approach could not be applied to relations between Russia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, maybe you know that uh, on the eve of presidential campaign, brilliantly described by Donaka, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, stated that it uh, would not uh, recognize the results of presidential election in so-called Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, because uh, Russia supports territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. This is why even a Russian approach are very different. Russia recognized uh, the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, 
but it uh, didn't apply the same scheme to Transnistria, and in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, it uh, behaves in the contrary uh, direction, in the, in the contrary way. Been interested to have uh, constructive relations both in Armenia and uh, with Azerbaijan and to provide the swing policy in the Caucasus uh, uh, lost uh, the influence on uh, Georgia, especially after events of 2008. I think uh, we need to uh, continue the uh, investigation of the de facto states, especially from uh, the point of their domestic development and dynamics. Of course, the factor of geopolitics and great powers are very important, but the, uh, without uh, prerequisites on the ground, it would be impossible to discuss uh, everything about Transnistria, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm also be glad to have your questions and comments. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sergey. Um, I realized I neglected some of my duties as host. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, Donica is a lecturer at the School of Law uh, and Government at Dublin City University, and he's also the editor of uh, this book here, The Color Revolutions in the Former Soviet Republics, which has just come out, um, and which, if you're interested in the topic, I encourage you to uh, go out and look for. Okay. Can I, can I also uh, continue your advertising line <laughs> <laughs> and to make a uh, brief advertising of my Briefly. paper published uh, last year. It's uh, entitled as the unrecognized states of Eurasia as phenomenon of the USSR uh, dissolution. It was published in Demokratizatsia journal and uh, previous year also due to the support of the Institute of the Caucasus based in Yerevan I published a small book on the de facto states of the post-Soviet space. Now it's available on the website of the Caucasus Institute in Russian. But I hope maybe in mid-term or short-term perspective, I would have the English uh, version of this paper in some variants or versions. Thank you. OK, so no shortage of, no shortage of materials out there. Um, let me just start with a, a brief observation and a question. Um, you know, Sergei mentioned this. I thought one of the real strengths of the discussion here was how you disaggregated these um, de facto states and you know really showed how um, they differ not only from um, the recognized states of the former Soviet Union but from one another as well. Um, that's one of the things that is really fascinating about the region or about these states for me, de facto states, uh, is that there are some commonalities between them, um, including that they've had these peaceful transfers of power, um, that they have relatively relatively free and fair um, elections, both at the parliamentary and the presidential level. And so I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe step back a little bit from the analysis of the individual cases and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what you see driving uh, some of the commonalities between these different republics and then just provide a little bit of context in that way. Yeah, I, I'm kind of reluctant to do so, and I'll tell you why. Is that my, my big thing that I came away with was that, and I, I, I'm in this, I'm reinforcing Sergey's point, and maybe implicitly my own, uh, that you know we we tend to look at these countries as de facto states and see that as their primary identity, that we should look at them as de facto states. And when I, you know, having spent so long there, I, it's almost like saying, well, you know, do you recognize states often have anything in common? If we compare the Philippines and Sweden and and and, and Greece. Will we make useful comparisons of their election campaigns? Well, yes, but uh, they actually have less in common than they have in common. And I, I would make the same point about the de facto states. I think that, and actually because of the fact that they're cut off from the world, that they lack that kind of freedom of movement, that they often don't have the same interaction, that they often, you know, therefore are almost laboratories by themselves. They don't actually have a lot of comparative processes to compare with. It, it, it's striking, though, because, I mean, compared to the other post-Soviet republics, and they share, obviously, a post-Soviet mm -hmm. political culture, there's something about the way that these processes are unfolding there that's just somehow different. I guess that's just, it, it's kind of a fascinating, as you said, laboratory, and I don't know sort of what to make of it in the bigger picture. Um, okay, let's turn it over to uh, questions from the audience. Please keep your interventions brief, and please keep them in the form of a question. So I saw uh, over here first. So my name is Vlad Spoon. I'm listed as a teaching with my teaching affiliation, but I'm from the Moldova Foundation. So I mostly will speak about Transnistria, which I know best. 
you are just saying, Jeff, commonality, I think, at least between Transnistria, South Ossetia, and, North, and uh, Abkhazia, the commonality is Russian support. Uh, and I think it's missing in this discussion, uh, at least from your side there, uh, about the geopolitical factor. And I'll, you, you mentioned, but you downsided the importance. Uh, if, you take, if you take the, the Russian support from Transnistria, I mean, Russian troops on the ground, intelligence services on the ground, controlling everything, financial support, economic support, you don't have anything what you described. So I think that, and, and I'm quite surprised why um, CSIS uh, didn't pick an analyst that will, will tackle this, uh, this uh, geopolitical factor. Uh, but after Sergei Makedonov uh, mentioned his position, I think it was completely clear that you are going to focus on only one, one, one uh, side of the story. Okay, and, uh, and I, is I, there a question in here? Because I think we need to have uh, sort of a, a uh, Q&A here. This is a comment, and I will ask other people who know Abkhazia, who know South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, to tell other side of the story, because otherwise everything is fine in these states. For 20 years, uh, there was ethnic cleansing. Okay, okay. We, we really need to have this in a sort of Q&A, so if, if there's not a specific question there, I'm just going to turn it back just over to the Just two quick points panelists. on that. Uh, the, the, it, 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 I'm familiar, more or less, with the, the points. And the issue of dependency, two things on that. If you were to take that criteria to its logical conclusion, we shouldn't look at elections in Ireland because Ireland is completely dependent on external aid right now. We couldn't survive for a moment without the lifeline of the European Central Bank and the IMF. So, and we're 440 billion euro in debt. So that's putting Transnistria's 3 billion debt to Gazprom in perspective. I just say that because if you just isolate it, dependency means you can't have a democratic election or a competitive election, or then you're, you're as I said, you have to take it to a logical conclusion with, with recognized states as well. And the second thing is, I mean, as I said myself, I don't think you were directing it primarily at me, I, I, I guessed implicitly, but the, the thing is, is that I did say that I'm not excluding the fact at all that the major powers play a role. All I'm saying is that the narrative has been exclusively focused on looking at the great power role in these regions, and we don't look at all at what happens just in the regions on, on their own terms. And that's why, I mean, I'm very happy that CSIS gave me the forum just to bring a new light on what is a rather stale story, because most of the time I read about these regions, it's all the same geopolitics and the same conflict resolution analysis, which is all very useful. I'm not dismissing it, but there are other aspects that we can look at, and that's all that I'm trying to do with this presentation. The problem is not uh, to be champion or opponent of the de facto state. Mm -hmm. You mentioned three cases, Transnistria, uh, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia, and united all of them due to the factor of uh, the Russian support. But the Russian support is very different in uh, all those cases. In case of Transnistria, Russia and de facto state uh, don't share the common border, as in the case of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. In case of Transnistria, don't forget about Ukrainian factor, by the way, and Ukrainian support of the tra Transnistrian uh, de facto statehood, which is absolutely absent in the case of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. I, I'm not admirer of Russia who uh, c uh, critic on, on Russia. The problem is uh, in uh, another context. We need to understand one thing, the domestic dynamics in de facto states exists. It's not good, it's not bad. Of course, I, I am not so naive to uh, deny the fact of Russian interests, geopolitical interests, as well as interests of uh, the West or Ukraine or Georgia or some other actors. It's, it's clear. But it's necessary to understand the situation is much more complex and uh, no, 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 not so simple, by the way. It's not restricted by the factor of the Russian support only. Because I think, uh, continuing the topic raised by Donaka and Jeff, uh, the problem is existence of legitimacy among non-recognized citizens, of course, due to ethnic cleansing or due to some other factors. But the factor of ethnic uh, cleansing, uh, dear friends, is uh, a part of practically all cases of the shaping of uh, nation states. What's about Sudet Sudetenland? What's about Silesia? What's about most of the countries of contemporary European Union? 
don't forget about those cases. It's, it's more usual and typical. Of course, I am not uh, going to justify those methods. But it's a part of nation building. It's not bad, it's not good. But there, there, there is an identity and there is a legitimacy of the non-recognized power among non-recognized citizens. Because don't forget that existence of the de facto state is connected with many restrictions and limits. Those presidents could not be accepted in the UN. The ambassadors uh, could not visit those entities, maybe only through the uh, prism of conflict resolution or so on. Economic sanctions, problems with visas, and so on. But regardless of aforementioned restrictions and limits, people continue to support those entities. It's interesting. It's, it, it doesn't relate only to the factor of Russia or factor of Armenia. And the Russian factor is uh, weaker in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's absent in the case of the North Republic of uh, Cyprus. But those entities are existing. OK, thanks. I saw Wayne. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. First, let me congratulate you on getting a standing room only uh, audience in Washington. I cannot tell you how, too much what a triumph uh, you've had here, uh, and entirely justified uh, by the quality of your presentation. I would be interested to know the reactions to your work in Chisinau, Tbilisi, and Baku, both because you've indicated that you wish to continue your work in the, these entities, and, which could be sensitive for those governments, and second, because your work uh, undercuts a major part of the rhetorical position in those cities about the democratic legitimacy in the entities. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'd be interested to know uh, how have they, how have those three capitals responded uh, to uh, to your research? I'd, I'd like to believe that my research is so influential that they've all made official statements on it, but um, I can tell you more from my interactions with people uh, on the ground and also within some of the political elites, particularly in Georgia. Georgia is a very, uh, Georgia is a very complex society and a very, I think the political elite there and, the, and the, the common people have a very nuanced understanding, or a lot of them do, of the difficulties involved. I mean, they've had lots of you know, failed attempts at resolving the conflicts and whatnot. So I, I certain, I've given this presentation in, in Tbilisi, and I have to say that I didn't receive any negative uh, background. There's a general understanding that the situation is complicated and that they really have to... That I, I think I, I certainly understand the Georgian government's desire to, when they come to DC, when they come to Brussels, that they present the issue in a in a paradigm that is Georgia Russia because it attracts a certain type of political figure in both Europe and you know who have memories of, of, of Russian uh, or Soviet uh, um, you might say imperial projects in Europe uh, and in DC among we'll say cold warriors or neo cold warriors but I think within Georgia themselves they realize that that's not really or at least it doesn't capture everything and therefore I have never found any uh, hostility I have to confess uh, I have to say that in my very brief encounters with with representatives from Azerbaijan I haven't found the same nuanced uh, response and um, I could one could speculate for for many reasons why that might be the case um, but it might be the political system I think I think Georgia is is, is a, I think the political culture in Georgia is such that you never can have a very authoritarian form of government or at least one that cannot be replaced because the political culture wouldn't uh, allow it to happen I'm not so sure the same can be said of Azerbaijan in Moldova I have to say my, my, my connection is much more tenuous uh, because I'm very much a South Caucasus person in terms of uh, political focus. Uh, but because Moldova, the Moldova Transnistria issue is not an ethnic one, I think that I've never found the same degree of passion that I see when I see, like Armenia, Azerbaijan, or, or Georgia, Russia, for example. That it, 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 I, I always feel more optimistic when I look at Moldova Transnistria in a way, because there's already so much interaction between the two uh, entities, Moldova and Transnistria. So without having any direct anecdotes that I could kind of illustrate the point, I, 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 I wouldn't think that they would be opposed to this. Um, I think that in environments like this, they tend to send often representatives to kind of put forward the official narrative. But I, I like to think that privately, they don't subscribe to what they say publicly that they actually genuinely do keep an eye on what's going on. OK, over here. Kionin Suleymanlı from the Embassy of Azerbaijan. Thank you for your um, presentation. I have a brief question. 
could you please uh, elaborate the reaction of the international organizations such kind of for the, such kind of events and also uh, how do you think what is the message that uh, you intend to convey through these events Thank you. The reaction of international organizations to the elections, which is, I guess, what you're asking, is, is uh, pretty straightforward. They don't recognize the elections. Um, and that's why, as an academic, I have to keep, I guess, emphasizing the point that I'm not a political representative. Um, it's a source of, of curiosity for me, and one that I'm unburdened by any feeling that I'm representing my country or a government or anything like that, that it's a legitimate research uh, question to find out what's going on with these elections. Because I think, you know, when you think about it, you know the elections take place, you know the results if you read about them, but you wonder, you always wonder, you must wonder, you know, how, how, what was it really like? I mean, were, you know, what were the slogans like? What were the people like? What were the, the public meetings like? And that was more or less why I conducted the research. Um, it, it, uh, so in terms of international organizations, none have recognized these elections. Uh, why I do the research or, or what motivates me, I had a similar question also coincidentally from the um, representative from Azerbaijan who asked me that. I, I always wonder is there something more to it than it meets the eye? I mean, am I representing anybody else or am I being funded by anybody? No, I mean, I, I, I simply bring the research to the attention of people because, you know, I think it's one of the ambitions of anybody who does research and writes about it that they'd like as many people as possible to read it and know about it, and that's a very human, I think, uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, but it's not part of any larger political project of mine. Okay, Andrew Nick. Thank you very much. I'm Andrew Nick from the Embassy of Armenia, mm -hmm. and I would like to uh, first thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And you are right that it is not usual that we have enjoy we uh, have the opportunity to enjoy presentations not on the political aspects of the conflict and not the conflict resolution, but on the specific needs of the people who are living on those territories. Like um, you uh, elaborated today on the right of people to uh, organize their uh, societies democratically. Uh, my question will relate will be somehow a follow up of my colleague from Azerbaijan. Bajani Embassy on the international organizations aspects. These uh, people in these uh, regions have managed to uh, organize their lives democratically without major international presence. Though uh, we have some uh, here and there observers from international organizations like in Nagorno-Karabakh in the last elections there were 82 observers from 22 countries. However, none of the major uh, international watchdogs like OSC or Council of Europe participated. Do you think that their participation will strengthen the um, uh, democratic uh, aspirations of people living there uh, anyhow or will, will help them to have guidelines how to go forward in these terms as they are doing in other parts of the Europe and uh, our uh, parts of the world. And my question will go also to Sergei. Thank you again for interesting presentation. And you mentioned uh, one point that probably the uh, non people of non-recognized states are sending sort of a signal message to international community by trying to organize their lives more and more democratically, just in probably in comparison with other neighboring states or states we are in conflict in um, you problem uh, it was yeah Deno who mentioned the uh, uh, Freedom House report like Nagorno Karabakh is partly free versus to Azerbaijan which is not free according to Freedom House how does this uh, things help in terms of conflict resolution is there uh, are there any do they have any influence on international community in their terms of attitude towards the conflicting parties and by the way again one if I may uh, point uh, we, and Sergei and Dona have put it is that international organizations didn't recognize or, uh, the elections in breakaway regions or non-recognized states. But in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, I must say that Ms. Group, for example, which includes Russia, uh, they recognize the right of Nagorno-Karabakh people to conduct their life, organize their life democratically, which is stated in the statement of a Ms. Group. Just points of that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, so it seems to be a continuation of the question about international organizations. To be honest, I myself personally don't have an opinion on it. Um, I, I don't think that they would necessarily make the elections more competitive or more democratic if there was international observation, because I don't think that's primarily why the elections are being conducted. I, I, this was one thing that was, even to a small extent, counterintuitive. I thought that the primary purpose of the elections would be somehow to impress internationally, but no internationals are really coming. You mentioned 82 observers in Nagorno-Karabakh, but most of those people are already well disposed towards 
Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and and you know and CIS observers in other uh, you know in Abkhazia, for example, are already without even before the election takes place have already more or less decided it's going to be okay. So you know these are. I don't. I don't think that that's why the elections are particularly, you know, better than the norm of the region. Uh, I think it's simply because they fulfil the function, as I argued, that elections are designed to do. That the people need leadership. They need someone to govern, particularly so in a state that has no international connections of any significance. So I think that, you know, I. I Obviously, when I spoke to people there, I, I spoke, for example, with the head of the Central Election Commission in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Transnistria, in uh, Abkhazia, and they were all asking for uh, the OSCE and people like that to come to offer technical assistance. They said, you don't have to recognize, you can just offer. But to be honest, they have that, that the knowledge of how to conduct a free and fair election is not rocket science, and it's already out there on the internet. And most of the electoral laws that Karabakh, Transnistria, Abkhazia have is more or less taken from best practice around the world. Now, how they implemented it might be another matter, but they have it in their documents. You know, if you look at the electoral law of these regions, there's nothing that you could really query about it. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, did you mean the statement of the Minsk group made on the eve of elections? Yes? Yeah, because it provoked uh, criticism and uh, some discussions. I think uh, there is a clear uh, alternative uh, for the political uh, dynamics in the de facto states. You could have a democratic or quasi or semi-democratic development through electoral campaigns, or you would have a federation of field commanders. As they put it in the Roman times, terzum non dato, here. Uh, what's the interest of the international community in those uh, hotspots or frozen hotspots? To have federation of field commanders or more or less controlled territory which, uh, face, uh, f which faces uh, electoral campaigns and democratic development. As for the uh, question on the conflict resolution, the answer depends on uh, your understanding. What, what, what do you mean speaking about the conflict resolution? Because from the Georgian point of view, conflict resolution is a restoration of the Georgian jurisdiction in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It would be conflict resolution. The same would be applied to Azerbaijan or Moldova. But uh, from the point of Nagorno-Karabakh or Abkhazia or Transnistria, the conf conflict resolution would mean a little bit different from their so-called parental states. Uh, this is why uh, I think the interest of the international community to have more or less stable and predictable territory, with no matter which status is, with no matter which flag is now on this territory, more or less democratic, more or less predictable and stable. That is an interest. I think it could, it could help uh, to uh, promotion of the conflict resolution. And the conflict resolution itself uh, will be dependent on the readiness of uh, sides engaged in the conflict to make any compromises. Okay, we're running a little bit short on time here, so I'm gonna try and take a couple of questions and we'll bundle them together, so please. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Menkov. I'm representing Embassy of Georgia. My name is Sia Ganjadze, and um, thank you for giving this opportunity to speak now because I think, and that's regretful that there is an elephant in the room and nobody really wants to touch upon this subject. And the elephant, uh, unfortunately, you know, is represents you know, those people who have been actually forced out of these territories. And very regretfully, I don't really see uh, any reflection with, with, you know, through methodology or through other, you know, sources that have been actually uh, consulted, you know, throughout the, the process of, re, you know, this research that would actually bring in the voice of those people. Uh, you are depicting a very happy, shiny picture where people go to elections and they're, you know, casting their votes. And, you know, yes, of course, they have right. But what about the right of those people, those 300,000 people, you know, Georgians, mostly ethnically, who have, you know, fled uh, Abkhazia as a result of ethnic cleansing? And this has been already established, you know, by international community. So I, my question, actually, I didn't really mean to ask questions today because I don't really think that there is enough depth, uh, I'm sorry, in this uh, research that would actually open 
uh, let's say, platform for some sort of scientific or academic discussion. But I would really like to ask one fundamental question. How can one actually, and maybe that's hypothetical more, uh, how can one think or even discuss electoral democracy in a society which is basically a classical ethnocracy? And you have uh, an argument, and there are you know, a couple of contradictions in your own research. Uh, there are no possibilities for people who are out of Apazia now and who do not, unfortunately, even have a hope uh, to return at some point, although, although their right to return, their right to their property has been also internationally recognized. So I'm wondering, I mean, and also those ethnic groups who and are and now and uh, living in Apazia, okay, they do not have any access to, uh, to governing. So my question would be, I mean, how, you know, do you see this? as a democracy. Okay, let's, let, let's take a couple more here. Thank you, I'll, I'll be quick. Arsen Haradzian from Voice of America's Armenian Service. Um, you're in a politicized city, so I, I assume you expect questions like this, so I'll try. I'm also studying conflict resolution, and conflict resolution is viewed like international relations here, which I think is not necessarily true. So my question will be, as somebody from Ireland, and Ireland is a, a role model for us for a successful conflict resolution, uh, if you had to compare the conflicts that you've been talking about, and, and maybe not necessarily talk about the democratic process, but where you would say they stand in the possibilities for the future resolution or, or transformation uh, in comparison to your own background in the conflict, uh, how would you picture or map out uh, those conflicts? Okay, maybe one more. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Danica, for your presentation. I'm Nick Wondra from Johns Hopkins SICE, and I applaud the work. I think that being the first person doing it is a really brave thing to do. My question is about democracy. We've covered elections, and that's excellent, but in political science theory, democratic governance is more than just elections. So I wonder if you might give any comment on what kinds of formal or informal checks on governance happen in these de facto republics. Thanks. Okay, so let's give it back over to Donica. So uh, refugees, the comparison with Ireland, and elections versus democracy. Yeah, and, and all very good questions. And to take the first one first, uh, why not emphasize those who have uh, forcibly left Abkhazia since uh, the early 1990s, and some of them left, of course, in 2008. Again, the, the analysis is framed not by what should be, and I think this is very much the difference in where we're coming from. You're representing a government, though I have to say the diversity of views in Georgia is, is quite pronounced. If I and may, I, today I do not represent all the government. I represent those Georgians who are not having any opportunity to go back to their homes. No, but uh, I think you understand my point. I mean, you're, you're a professional occupation as, as a representative of the Georgian government, and I'm just simply saying that I have spent enough, I've been in Georgia for the best part of a dozen years, I go, I, I've just come from Tbilisi, and uh, I'm aware that there's a diversity of views in the subject. Yours is one, and it's one that matters to a lot of people, but it's not the only one, and I'm, I don't have to feel in that way that I have to respond necessarily to, to your point of view as if you're representing George, or even representing IDPs, which are also a diverse group, of which many of my friends and former students, actually. Um, but the point about why, why not to emphasize it more, well, of course, in a short presentation, there are many things I could have emphasized, but as I said, the, the, the framework was what is happening now, not what should happen, which is implicit in your question. I mean, your, your, your question implies that we should emphasize that this is not uh, this or it shouldn't be called that because, and I, I don't go down that road. I mean, people regarding Karabakh say the same. They say, what about the people, the quarter of the population who were there during Soviet times who are not there now? Um, but as I said, that's not my role to, 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 to look at the electoral, I'm looking at an electoral process. I mean, people, people come and go uh, from different pol polities and to say what might have been had people been there is, is, is something, I, I understand why somebody would say from Georgia might say that that's something important, but from, an, from my own academic perspective, it wasn't my focus. I, and when you design a research project, you design it. I mean, you, it wasn't something that I try, I have met the Georgian government in exile, for example. Um, who have their own views, of course, on what is happening in Afghanistan. So again, it's not that I'm unfamiliar, but my, my focus was on what is happening now. 
and what is the society now in, 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 in Abkhazia uh, and in the other de facto uh, states. As far as the ethnocracy is concerned, I did emphasize that. I didn't kind of try to make it into, as you said, a shiny, happy people. I simply said that you had to be Abkhaz to run for president. I made that point. I stressed it. I, so, I showed how the majority of people in the Abkhaz National Assembly are ethnic Abkhaz, and I implied that that was un, unrepresentative of the population in Abkhazia. So I think that you're imputing more to my presentation than, I think it says perhaps more about your, where you're coming from than where I'm coming from, to be honest. Um, but anyway, going to, to conflict resolution, this is a great question. And the last slide, which I didn't get to show, shows, ah, oops, sorry. A good old friend of mine, Levan Gikinishvili from Georgia, Mikhail Zolyan from Armenia, and my wife, and myself, Nassim Smalyan, Navorna Karabakh, Bertie Ahern, who was one of the signatories of the Good Friday Agreement uh, with Tony Blair, of course, he'd be his counterpart. Uh, Vladimir Yastrachak from Transnistria, former mm -hmm. foreign minister of Transnistria until recently, and near my back garden, the whole group of them together with uh, Maxim Vinja from Abkhazia, who was for for many years, an acolyte of Shamba in, in, in many uh, administrations in, in, in Sukumi. So, um, so I, I did, yes, sorry? Yeah, I, I said no with the purpose of that. Yes, and I invited, and this actually is interesting. I don't want to go down this road now because it's not exactly what, what the question is. I did actually invite. I realize that you, you, you don't want to go down. Ah, you see, here we go again. Um, the thing is, <laughs> I did invite, they did accept, and at the very last minute, I mean, if, you, if you'd like me to forward you, they, they pulled out, and actually it's the reason why in this book that you, you advertise, I actually also had a contributor from Azerbaijan who pulled out under government pressure because there's no freedom of thought, unfortunately, in many spheres in Azerbaijan. And that's, that's a reality, I think, that you have to deal with, not try and put the emphasis on me of why I don't include people from Azerbaijan. I invite them, they accept, and then they, they talk to people back home and they say, actually, we can't come because there's going to be somebody from the other side and that's not going to be helpful for me when I go back. That's been my experience. I'm just speaking from where I'm coming from, from practical experience, not an abstract ideal, not a theory, not a policy position of a government. That it's sounded just... like an accusation. What? Well, it was a statement of my experience. Anyway, um, the, conflict, the conflict resolution, uh, Northern Ireland, this is why I emphasize it, because I invited the author of the Good Fight Agreement to meet these people from the regions, and uh, so we could, in, you know, try and look at a comparative context. I'm less optimistic, to be honest, about conflict resolution in these regions, with the exception of maybe Moldova, Transnistria, where, as I said, I don't think it's as passionate uh, because of the lack of an ethnic dimension to it in large part. Um, but in the Caucasus, I'm very pessimistic compared to Northern Ireland. And let me tell you why, because, and it comes back to the point made by, by our, our, our representative from Georgia. I mean, it, when the populations were expelled as a result of war, and we won't get into the whereabys of why these wars started, uh, but when, when, when they were expelled, the population that was involved in expelling them more or less believe now that the conflict is over. Uh, in Northern Ireland, you had two communities almost evenly divided, and they still exist in Northern Ireland. About 50% want to be part of United Ireland, 50% want to join with the United Kingdom. We have to find a way for those people to live together. And therefore, and, you, and also, and this is crucial, and it's, it may sound like an accusation to some, we had two democratic sovereign governments, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, who felt more in common with each other than they did with their ethnic kin in Northern Ireland. So for example, our, our Bertie Ahern will say, was going to Tony Blair and saying, how will we sort out Northern Ireland together? They weren't listening to those in Northern Ireland who were saying, you should support us because you're the same ethnicity as us. They were going to each other and saying, how do we solve this common problem together? Those were crucial elements which do not exist in the South Caucasus, to state the obvious. Uh, the people in Abkhazia and in Nagorno-Karabakh who currently live there view the situation as one that's been more or less solved because they've expelled the populations. And that's something that was different in Northern Ireland. You had the populations living together. And secondly, uh, to stress the obvious, you don't have consolidated democracies in the Caucasus. So you have governments which are, to varying degrees, authoritarian to dictatorial. And they are, I don't know of any history of conflict resolution where you get dictatorships more or less solving conflicts in any kind of systematic or long-lasting, sustainable way. So until those issues are resolved, I, I'm very pessimistic, to be honest. And I'm simplifying, of course. I mean, everybody, I think, when they ask a question, assumes that I'm leaving out something. I'm only leaving out something because I've only very little time to answer these questions. But uh, in short, I'm pessimistic. And the final question about uh, formal and informal checks. It's a very good question, but again, I, I fall back on my, my, my defensive armor that I used against the first question, that it's not my focus uh, to, to look at the institutions. But since you ask it, um, the checks and balances are not particularly good uh, in, in Abkhazia, in, in, in Transnistria. They're a little bit better in Transnistria, not, not good in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, necessarily, um, because usually what you have is the, par the party uh, of the president or the 
acolytes of the president are usually in control of parliament. Our parliament is so weak that it, it can never possibly challenge uh, the, the, the power of the presidency. Civil society, it depends. In Abkhazia, it's quite strong, for example. Karabakh, it's not strong. Uh, Transnistria, not that strong. So, you, you know, it varies again from state to state. Um, the, so, I, I, yeah, I would be... I would be saying there's not strong. If, again, to give a very short answer to a very complicated question, the checks and balances are not good. A good example, Abkhazia recently, I, I say this, I'm interested because I'm a professor. Um, Bruno Kopiter, some of you may have heard of him. He's a professor, a Flemish professor, Belgian professor, I should say, um, who uh, is, 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 is an author of many works on, on, um, on Georgia, on Abkhazia. He went to give some guest lectures in Sukhumi recently uh, at the university on ethnicity and conflict resolution and whatnot. And Angfab himself uh, vetoed, the, he gave one lecture, I think, and he vetoed the rest of them, uh, saying that he wasn't going to have the students of Abkhazia propagandized by this foreign professor. And, you know, uh, students from Abkhazia were not able to travel to the European Union, so why should European Union professors be coming to Abkhazia and giving lectures? That shows you an authoritarian streak in Angfab, but it also shows you how, how much power he can arbitrarily exert, that he can say to a university, which should be an independent, you know, freedom of thought kind of a place, he can say who will actually give a lecture and who will not give a lecture. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I, I'm glad you raised it, but it wasn't the focus of my, my, my thing, because if I was to go down that road, that's a huge area of institutions and checks and balances. This is another research project in its entirety, and I have enough on my plate just dealing with the electoral processes. So uh, that would be my answer to that. So. Okay, we're already a couple of minutes over time, so I think we're going to have to wrap this up. I want to thank you all again for coming, and please let's uh, give a warm round of applause to our guests. <laughs>